Bon, Yutro, bonjour à toutes et tous. Good morning and a very warm welcome to the, all of you. On behalf of the ICTY, it is my pleasure to greet you at the outset of this two-day international conference. The first such ICTY Global Legacy Conference took place, as you may remember, in February 2010. This first follow-up conference also takes place against the background of the Tribunal's completion strategy. However, it is going to be more specifically devoted to exploring the actual impact of the Tribunal's judicial work since 1994 on international humanitarian law, substantively, and on international criminal procedure. Today and tomorrow, leading academics, international judges, and international practitioners will take us through an exciting journey how has the ICTY groundbreaking jurisprudence impacted on the development of a global justice system? How has the interaction of common law and civil law procedures impacted the fairness and efficiency of ICTY's cases? How does this unique case law take us further on the road to ending impunity, and finally, how will it shape the future advancement and enforcement of human rights? Today and tomorrow, there's four high-level panel discussions will be held in front of you, and they will be introduced in detail in due course. For now, I would like to ex extend to you a number of invitations. The first one, of course, is to make sure, please, that your cell phones are switched off. Another invitation is to bear in mind that this conference is a public event. Media representatives, and the ICTY welcomes them, are present. Furthermore, please note that what is going to be said will be recorded, and as a result, a video as well as a written transcription of the conference proceedings will be uploaded in due course onto the ICTY website. The last invitation is please to carefully listen to the bell, which will ring at the end of each break, indicating that the next session is about to begin. That being said, I'm pleased to request your attention for the official opening remarks, which are going to officially launch this two-day conference. And they will be delivered in turn by Judge Patrick Robinson, the president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, by His Excellency Jean-Marc Hoche 8, ambassador of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg to the Netherlands, by Mr. Philip Brent, Minister at the Embassy of Switzerland to the Netherlands, and finally, Ms. Edison Cole of the Open Society Justice Initiative. The ICTY would like to acknowledge the generous sponsorship of the conference by the following governments, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, the Republic of Korea, as well as the Municipality of The Hague and the Open Society Justice Initiative. May I now please ask your attention for His Excellency Judge Patrick Robinson, President of the ICTY. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, I extend to you my warmest welcome 
It is an honor to open this conference today, and I am indeed delighted to see how many persons are in attendance. We have a full house, or almost a full house, and in that sense, I think we are coming close to matching the attendance that we had at the first Legacy Conference. With the lineup of eminent scholars and practitioners, we have as our moderators and panelists, and the issues that we will discuss over the next two days, I am not surprised that so many of you have found the time to join us. And I encourage you all not to be shy and to actively participate. During each of the panel sessions, the floor will be open and there will be an opportunity for you to make your contribution and I urge you to do so. And once again, do not be shy. The tribunal is not afraid of criticism. It is through your participation that we will ensure a rich and fruitful debate of the issues on our agenda. But before I continue, it is fitting at the opening of this conference to pay tribute to a colleague of tremendous influence on the foundational jurisprudence of the tribunal who has recently, very sadly, passed away. And I am, of course, talking of Nino Cassese, a man known to all of you as a giant in international humanitarian law and international criminal law. I think you may have already heard on many occasions, with respect to Nino, the statement that sometimes in history, an individual has the opportunity to make a real difference in the world. In the tribunal's history, that individual is without doubt its first president, Nino Cassese. I need only remind you of the decision of the appeals chamber in the Tadic case concerning the tribunal's jurisdiction over which Judge Cassese presided and which laid the blueprint for almost every substantive decision that followed in the jurisprudence of this tribunal and also of our sister tribunal, the ICTR. This decision has also had a significant influence on the jurisprudence of the Special Court of Sierra Leone, as well as the Cambodian Tribunal, both which have relied to a great extent on the jurisprudence of the ICTY and the ICTR. In each tribunal, the intellectual mark of Cassese cuts deep. And I have no doubt that his mark will also be felt at the ICC. But Cassius's work at this tribunal and his subsequent influence on these other international criminal tribunals represented only a fraction of his contribution to international criminal law. His tenacity and commitment to international justice was equally pivotal at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the court to which he was assigned as president, and then as an appeal judge shortly before he left us. I would therefore be grateful if you could all stand for a minute's silence in remembrance of our dear friend, colleague, teacher, and mentor, Judge Nino Cassese.
Thank you very much. As I've already said, ladies and gentlemen, I expect the next two days to provide a rich and fertile forum for intellectually challenging and stimulating discussion about the global impact of the work of this tribunal. What has been the impact of the tribunal on customary international humanitarian law? What has been the impact of the tribunal on defining the substantive offenses of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity? What has its impact been on the procedures adopted by international criminal courts? And are those procedures fair? And finally, what has been the tribunal's impact on the global advancement of human rights? These are just some of the questions which we will have the opportunity over the next two days to debate and to reflect on. And I look forward to engaging in that debate with you. To get the conference started, I would now like to call upon our incredibly benevolent benefactors. Without their generosity, this conference would not have been possible, and we all owe them our thanks. For clarity, I name them for you, the governments of the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, the Republic of Korea, the Municipality of The Hague, and the Open Society Justice Initiative. Their generosity is particularly appreciated in light of the dire financial circumstances that we currently face. Despite this hardship, they have recognized the importance of the groundbreaking work of this tribunal and have come out in force in support of this initiative. And for that, I congratulate them. I now ask the Ambassador of Luxembourg to the Netherlands, His Excellency Jean-Marc Horscheid, to take the floor for his opening remarks. Thank you. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les Juges, Monsieur le Procureur, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, d'un gré, je voudrais vous transmettre les salutations du Vice-Premier Ministre et Ministre des Affaires étrangères du Luxembourg, Monsieur Jean Hasselborn, qui m'a chargé tout particulièrement de vous faire part de l'importance primordiale qu'il attache à la présente conférence. Pour qui s'intéresse à l'histoire et au devenir du continent européen, il n'est en effet que naturel de se préoccuper de l'héritage de cette instance juridictionnelle, née des affres des guerres sanglantes qui ont déchiré les Balkans occidentaux au début des années 90. Car si les travaux qui nous réunissent ici seront consacrés très largement à l'apport significatif de la jurisprudence du tribunal en matière de développement des normes internationales, ainsi qu'au plan du droit procédural international, force est de constater que l'héritage du tribunal peut également être cerné et évalué sur un plan plus politique, à l'aune de son impact sur la pacification et la réconciliation dans les Balkans, et son influence systémique plus large au plan international. En effet, il s'agit de nous rappeler à quel point l'action du tribunal, au-delà même de son activité juridictionnelle, c'est également inséré dans le contexte politique plus large d'une région qui cherche à dépasser les démons du passé pour dégager les voies d'un développement stable et pacifique. Dans cette recherche, il était essentiel que tant les exigences de la consolidation de la paix que la demande de justice, portée en particulier par les victimes et leurs proches, fussent abordées ouvertement et avec courage. 
Jamais le tribunal n'a travaillé en vase clos de manière abstraite. Toujours son action inspirée par les exigences les plus élevées de la protection des normes de l'état de droit et d'impartialité a aussi été pertinente au regard d'une vision d'avenir positive pour la région et ses populations. Jugement après jugement, le tribunal a développé cet important et imposant héritage jurisprudentiel dont l'influence s'est fait sentir et continuera à influer de manière significative l'émergence d'un véritable droit criminel international que nous appelons de nos voeux. Ce faisant, elle a établi de manière éclatante qu'une paix durable ne saurait être construite sans que justice soit rendue. Sur base, des critères légaux et professionnels, sur base des critères légaux et professionnels les plus rigoureux. Ce message est exigeant, mais juste. A également, il a été également relayé par la communauté internationale et au premier chef, par l'Union européenne, qui a fait de manière constante de la coopération pleine et entière avec le tribunal une condition incontournable dans la réalisation de cette perspective européenne à laquelle aspirent légitimement les pays de la région. Et ceci n'est pas seulement l'expression d'une politique constante de lutte contre l'impunité, mais aussi le reflet, le reflet de cette communauté de valeurs qui doit réunir la famille européenne. Alors que sur le plan international, et notamment à travers la Cour pénale internationale, la lutte contre l'impunité se poursuit et se consolide en particulier sur base du riche héritage jurisprudentiel du tribunal, mais aussi des autres cours et tribunaux internationaux actifs dans ce domaine, il est possible de tirer une fierté certaine du fait qu'au sein du tribunal, du fait que c'est au sein du tribunal que pour la première fois un chef d'État en exercice a été poursuivi, créant ainsi un précédent d'une importance politique et juridique majeure. Aujourd'hui, il est établi sans aucun doute que personne, quel que soit son rang, ne saurait échapper à la nécessité de devoir rendre compte des crimes les plus graves. Félicitons-nous également qu'avec l'arrestation et l'extradition à la haie de messieurs Karadzic, Mladic et Hadzic, est donc, il est désormais manifeste que la justice criminelle internationale a le bras long et que nul ne saurait lui échapper que nul n'y saurait échapper. Là encore, le tribunal a créé des faits incontournables dont l'importance politique et psychologique n'échappe à personne, y compris, faut-il espérer, d'éventuels po auteurs potentiels de crimes. Enfin, il convient de relever que par son exemple même, mais aussi à travers son interaction permanente avec les systèmes euh, judici judiciaires nationaux, le tribunal et son procureur ont eu un impact significatif sur les institutions, mais aussi sur l'état d'esprit, je dirais même la culture politique et juridique dans la région. Telle est également une dimension majeure et durable de l'héritage du tribunal. Si ces avancées se situent dans le contexte d'un processus international qui va en se fortifiant de lutte contre l'impunité, elles prennent une signification additionnelle lorsque nous nous plaçons dans la perspective des victimes et de leurs proches. Plus que pour tout autre, c'est pour eux que le fait de se voir rendre justice à travers un processus objectif et impartial est un moment crucial dans la guérison des blessures et le dépassement des traumatismes. Voilà pourquoi la justice est également une dimension essentielle dans tout processus de réconciliation durable. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, victimes des affrontements guerriers les plus sanglants qui ont déchiré l'Europe au cours des siècles, mais aussi partie prenante active d'un projet européen qui repose sur la réconciliation des ennemis d'antan, mon pays, le Luxembourg, a soutenu et soutient avec conviction et ferveur l'action menée par le tribunal pénal international pour l'ex-Yougoslavie et salue avec respect l'œuvre accomplie. L'héritage du tribunal, dont nous aurons un débat aujourd'hui et demain, constitue la synthèse de l'expérience acquise de, depuis sa création en 1993 dans un contexte historique spécifique. Mais cet héritage est également un héritage porteur d'avenir pour, pour une communauté internationale qui ne tolérera plus à l'avenir 
que les crimes les plus graves restent impunis. C'est dans cette perspective que Luxembourg est fier et honoré d'avoir pu contribuer à la réalisation de cette conférence dont les travaux et les résultats ne manqueront pas d'être riches et fructueux. Celle, tel est en tout cas mon vœu le plus cher. Je vous remercie de votre attention. The next speaker will be Mr. Philippe Brent, uh, Minister at the Embassy of Switzerland. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the International Tr Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was established as a measure to restore and maintain peace and to promote reconciliation in the region. The decision to set up an ad hoc criminal tribunal was taken in recognition of the primacy of justice in ensuring the accountability of per perpetrators and in providing redress to victims. Moreover, this decision was taken during the conflict itself in the belief that the threat of prosecution would act as a deterrent to all, to all involved parties uh, to refrain from committing further atrocities. With the benefit of hindsight, almost 20 years later, we are in a better position to assess the legacy of the ICTY, both as a legal instrument in investigating and prosecuting violations of international humanitarian law and as a preventative measure. I will not venture today to speak about the legal legacy of the ICTY, as this is the focus of the upcoming conference. Yet, it is worthwhile, worthwhile to recall that, although it was the first, uh, the first international criminal court to be established since the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, the ICTY was not created in a legal and political vacuum. Since the early 90s, The then UN Commission on Human Rights addressed the issue of accountability for gro gross violations of human rights in post-conflict transition, encompassing the right to know, the right to justice, the right to reparation, and guarantees for, of non-recurrence. Needless to say, the ICTY and its fellow tribunal, the International Criminal Court for Rwanda, provided a much needed frame of reference for the development of the right to justice by demonstrating that persons responsible for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, can be, can be brought to trial and thus that international criminal law is enforceable. Experience has shown, however, that justice alone cannot provide full satisfactions to victims nor can it by itself address the many challenges that societies face in dealing with the legacy of violent conflict. This is the rationale behind a comprehensive and inclusive approach to dealing with a past that includes the full range of measures as outlined in the aforementioned principles against impunity. This has proven particularly true in the Balkans, where the justice approach has been the dominant paradigm largely due to the influence of the ICTY and its completion program focusing on domestic war crime trials. It is only in recent years, in connection with initiatives such as the establishment of a national missing persons institute in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the civil society consultation process to establish a regional fact-finding commission called RECOM, that other mechanisms are being explored to address outstanding issues relating to the right of victims and the duties of the state. In this regard, I may mention that briefly that Switzerland, together with Argentina and Morocco, introduced a resolution at the 18th session of the UN Human Rights Council in September to create a new mandate for a UN Special Rapporteur on truth, justice, reparation and guarantees of non-recurrence. The resolution was passed by consensus, including all the UN member states from former Yugoslavia. 
In this regard, I would like to add a concluding uh, remark. Perhaps the greatest contribution of the ICTY to peace and reconciliation in the region has been to establish the facts of what happened during the conflict and to determine the measure of individual criminal responsibility for the grave crimes committed. It remains for this and future generations in the region to build upon this legacy and to broaden it, broaden it with their own experiences in the search for truth and justice in the years to come. For us, who have been following the work of the tribunal for almost two decade, decades, the legacy of the ICTY may remind us that human rights violations do not take place in the abstract. They affect real people in real situations, in their homes, among family and friends, in their wider communities. Accordingly, the work of justice in the very fundamental sense of righting a wrong must also in some way be made real, that is, visible and understood in concrete terms to people in their daily lives. What that might mean for a victim in the Balkans is not easily answered in The Hague. This is a challenge that touches one of the core issues of international humanitarian law. It is a task that lies before us and that deserves further reflection as we engage in the further elaboration of the legal architecture relating to the right to justice and the struggle against impunity to which the ICTY has added its own measure of justice. Thank you. And finally, the last opening remark will be delivered by Ms. Alison Cole from the Open Society Justice Initiative. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, Honourable Guests, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to join our hosts in welcoming you to this Global Legacy Conference. Our discussions over the next two days come at an opportune time to consider the contextual and lasting impact made by our international courts and tribunals. We are on the brink of some momentous milestones for international justice and it is useful to recall the broader context within which the ICTY operates. In 2012, the ICTY and the ICTR will approach their 20th anniversaries. The International Criminal Court will mark its 10th anniversary. The Special Court for Sierra Leone will complete its trials, and the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cam Cambodia will be in the midst of its second case against senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge regime. Each institution operates in a very different and unique context. However, there are similar legacy themes particularly the issue of the strengthening of the rule of law, which will be addressed over the course of this conference. And briefly considering some key legacy achievements of each court or tribunal, which in turn constitutes part of the legacy of the ICTY as the first such tribunal, I would also like to highlight for you some aspects regarding accountability for gender crimes that each court or tribunal has contributed to in achieving the globally applicable legacy of international courts and tribunals. With the respect to the ICTY, this tribunal leads the way, led the way in forging a new path to justice in the 1990s, picking up from the international criminal law precedents established at Nuremberg. Both the ICTY and the ICTR faced the issue of being established outside the country over which they had jurisdiction, and both came to appreciate the need to take additional efforts outside the courtroom to ensure the judgments would resonate in the local context. The ICTY, for its part, pioneered outreach for international justice and peer-to-peer -peer capacity building with local justice officials. The ICTR, in turn, also conducted trainings and worked closely with local civil society intermediaries. Indisputably, one of the most far-reaching and landmark achievements of the ad hoc tribunals has been the development of the law regarding gender crimes. Prior to the establishment of the ICTY, the characterization of rape as a war crime remained debated in some quarters. Now it is fully established that rape may constitute a war crime, a crime against humanity, 
and genocide. The tribunals have further recognized rape and other forms of sexual violence as a means of torture, forms of persecution, and indicia of slavery, in addition to other crimes such as inhuman acts. They have articulated progressive definitions of rape, and the heart-wrenching cases before these tribunals have galvanized a global movement recognizing sexual violence as an instrument of war and oppression. A further critical legacy impact of the ICTY is the role it has played in paving the way for other international and high royal tribunals that followed. The first of such subsequent tribunals, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, currently has particularly pressing legacy issues to address. The Special Court would be the first international court to close, with trial proceedings expected to terminate with the final judgment concerning Charles Taylor anticipated for early next year. The Special Court has had the advantage of having all but one of their trials held in Sierra Leone itself, with more ready access to the national institutions in order to enhance its legacy impact. However, the Open Society Justice Initiative issued a report last week regarding the legacy of the Special Court and identified key steps that remain to be taken to secure the legacy of the Court, in particular through ensuring the judgments are analysed to find a way in which they can be utilised in local courts. It is important to highlight that the Special Court has also made valuable contributions to the rule of law regarding gender crimes. Building upon the precedents established at the ICTY regarding enslavement, the Special Court was the first court to convict for sexual slavery as provided for in its statute. The Special Court also considered the scope for addressing new emerging fact patterns under the so-called residual category of crimes against humanity, namely other inhuman acts. The Sierra Leone civil war involved militia forcing women to engage in conjugal relationships, which the judges found to constitute a crime against humanity as another inhuman act of forced marriage. This precedent has been followed at the extraordinary chambers in Cambodia, where the co-investigating judges charged the accused in case file two with forced marriage. It is a similarly critical time for the Khmer Rouge court to consider its legacy. With the largest courtroom in the world sitting some 500 observers, the court has made remarkable efforts over the course of the first trial against Doik, head of S21 Detention Centre, to bring people from all over Cambodia to watch the trials. Over 20,000 people were in attendance. Now with the court starting its second trial, with nearly 4,000 victims participating, and with serious questions over the status of the two remaining investigations, the Khmer Rouge court must ensure its legacy by conducting fair and independent trials and investigations. Finally, the question of whether the ICC has a legacy impact remains to be considered. The Open Society Justice Initiative is looking into this issue currently and is seeking to determine what steps a permanent institution would need to take in order to enhance its contribution to the local setting in which it operates. There are many questions to be answered, such as the extent to which positive complementarity contributes towards the ICC's legacy and how the prosecutor can best manage decisions on preliminary analysis situations or investigations that are closed. It is remarkable to recall that the Rome Statute was being negotiated in 1998 at the very early stages of international awareness of the law regarding gender crimes. Perhaps one of the most tangible legacy impacts of the ICTY are the detailed provisions in the Rome Statute specifying prohibitions against rape and sexual violence. The groundbreaking gender, case, gender cases before the ICTY led the ICC to recognise not just rape, but sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy and enforced sterilisation in its statute, as well as gender-based persecution and trafficking in women and children. Including these crimes in the Rome Statute is a truly amazing achievement following the efforts of the ICTY. Although far from adequate, and there is still much more to be done in redressing gender crimes and the offensive stereotypes surrounding sex crimes, the groundbreaking jurisprudence from the ICTY will be instrumental in interpreting the Rome Statute and ending impunity. Indeed, all but one of the situations before the ICC include gender crimes in its charges. This conference provides a unique forum to consider many key matters pertaining to the legacy of the ICTY, which in turn relates to all other international courts and tribunals. I am very much looking forward to the panel discussions and thank you all for your participation.
So thanks to the conferences for first speakers. I believe their uh, opening remarks have laid down the fundamentals of uh, the conference, which is now going to be really starting with the first panel. The topic of the panel is, and I quote from your program, the impact of the tribunal's substantive jurisprudence on the elucidation of customary international law. This panel is going to be shared and moderated by Judge Theodore Miron, Miron, elected to the ICTY in March 2001, Judge Miron became the president of the ICTY only two years later. The ICTY president until November 2005, Judge Miron has recently been re-elected to another two-year term of the presidency to start on the 17th of November, which is the day after tomorrow. Judge Miron is the only ICTY judge who has ever been in such a position. A leading scholar of international humanitarian law and criminal law and human rights law, Judge Miron has authored numerous articles and books about international humanitarian law, as well as about Shakespeare and more specifically about the laws of war and chivalry in Shakespeare's play. In addition to being awarded a number of international awards, he is a member of the Institute of International Law and a fellow of the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It therefore is my pleasure to turn the floor to Judge Theodore Miron, who will introduce himself, the panelists. Thank you very much. May I invite my colleagues to join me here, please? Panel number one. Is it working? It gives me great pleasure indeed to open this panel on the impact of the tribunal's substantive jurisprudence on the elucidation of customary international law. I am grateful to President Robinson and to his staff, in particular Gabriel McIntyre and Diane Brown, for all of their efforts in helping to organize this conference and this morning's discussion. I am also very grateful to our distinguished panelists for joining us, Professor George Abissa, Professor James Crawford, Dr. Jean-Marie Hankerts, and Mona Rishmawi have each made and continue to make very important contributions to the field of international humanitarian law. We are indeed fortunate to have such stellar participants with us here today. I would like now to offer a few thoughts as to why customary humanitarian law plays a critical role for the ICTY and other international criminal tribunals, 
and why the ICTY in turn has played a critical role in the elucidation of customary international humanitarian law. Only 20 years ago, I would have described customary international law primarily as a matter of scholarly inquiry. Today, however, customary law is enjoying a remarkable revival, effectively moving from the domain of academia to the courtroom and beyond. The roots of this revival, I would suggest, can be traced back to the trials conducted at Nuremberg in the wake of the Second World War. Although the London Charter gave the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg jurisdiction over crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, some suggested that the Charter amounted to an unlawful ex post facto law. The Nuremberg Tribunal also could not rely heavily on treaties in construing the ambits of the crimes within its jurisdiction. The Geneva POW Convention of 1929 was not applicable on the Eastern Front as it had not been ratified by the Soviet Union. And the application of the Force Hague Convention was challenged because the situation of the belligerents did not conform with its Siamese clause, since not all of the belligerents were parties. Moreover, while the relevant provisions of both the Geneva and the Hague Conventions defined substantive proscriptions, the conventions did not explicitly criminalize their violation. As a result, a question arose as to whether the legality principle had been satisfied. In other words, whether the accused had been sufficiently on notice at the time of the alleged offense that their conduct entailed criminal liability. In answering this question, the Nuremberg Tribunal reasoned that the law of war was to be found not only in treaties, but also in customary international law and in general principles of justice. In other words, insofar as the ex-charged were in fact crimes under customary international law when committed, they could not be said to amount to impermissible ex post facto prescriptions, proscriptions. This conclusion received some criticism. Nonetheless, by becoming the first international court to look to customary law underpinnings of international crimes, the Nuremberg Tribunal opened the way for all that followed. Not surprisingly, the ICTY faced many of the same challenges as the Nuremberg Tribunal, which, despite its historical merit, was, in effect, an occupation court. Although the ICTY's jurisdiction is defined by a statute adopted by the UN Security Council, the statute did not even exist when some of the relevant crimes were committed, and it was unclear whether all the relevant nations were party to treaties that definitively prohibited those crimes. Accordingly, in his famous report accompanying the adoption of the statute, the UN Secretary General noted that the application of the principle Nullum Crimen Sine Lege, the legality principle, requires that the International Tribunal should apply rules of international humanitarian law which are beyond any doubt, and I'm quoting from him, part of customary law. It might fairly be asked whether a conviction for violating uncodified customary international law can ever meet the living criminal standard. I do not believe, however, that the legality principle 
bars such convictions. Customary humanitarian law largely prohibits acts that everyone would assume to be criminal anyway, rape, murder, torture, attacking civilians, and so forth. In keeping with the Secretary General's report, and in order both to ensure basic fairness to the accused and to forestall some of the same criticisms leveled against the Nuremberg Tribunal, the ICTY has essentially superimposed on each statutory crime an additional safeguard, namely a requirement that crimes charged under the statute were crimes also under customary law at the time they are alleged to have been committed. And we take pains to explain the customary and conventional underpinnings of our rulings. Ours, of course, is not the only international judicial body to have turned to customary law in recent years. Reference to customary law has helped a wide range of international courts and other bodies address substantive gaps in conventional law, resolve disputes where one or more parties have not ratified the relevant instruments, or have ratified them with reservations, and construe the provisions of existing treaties. But if customary law has proven increasingly important in courts addressing civil matters, it has shown itself to be absolutely central to the work of international criminal tribunals. Although less relevant for the new International Criminal Court, whose statute resembles a civil law code, customary law comes up in the ad hoc International Criminal Tribunals in almost every case and frequently has an impact on the outcome. Indeed, if we have witnessed a resurgence of interest in and attention to customary international law in the past two decades, I would suggest that it is in no small part because of the establishment of the ICTY and its jurisprudence. So how does the ICTY go about identifying customary international law? In cases where the unlawfulness of the conduct at issue would have been clear at the time, the tribunal need not engage in a laborious inquiry into the question of whether a particular legal principle enjoyed the status of customer law. As the ICTY appeals chamber stated in Celibici, acts such as murder, torture, and rape are obviously unlawful. Some of the ICTY cases, however, involve conduct of less obvious criminality. In such cases, the relevant customary law must be ascertained, and the tribunal's chambers tend to adopt a methodologically conservative approach in this regard, requiring a showing that there is a widespread, though not necessarily perfect, perfectly consistent, state practice supported by opinion juries at the time of the offense. The tribunal will not engage in a de novo inquiry into customary law each time, of course. In many cases, the tribunal has relied on its own precedent instead of revisiting the same issues repetitively, an approach that can hardly be faulted. It has also relied to some extent on proxies, such as the long-standing recognition of the customary status of Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions by the International Court of Justice in the Nicaragua case, in, pla in, in place of the comprehensive detailing every and each time of state practice. And now I would like uh, to turn to the last part of my remarks, namely to offer some examples of the ICTY's 
customary law jurisprudence. Not surprisingly, much of our jurisprudence on this question has focused on substantive law. The Galich case, for example, concerned a conviction for terrorization of the civilian population of Sarajevo. The trial chamber based the conviction on addition protocol one alone, while the appeals chamber, following the tribunal's self-imposed norms, grounded it in customary humanitarian law. The appeals chamber concluded that the conduct at issue was clearly prohibited by customary international law at the relevant time. In the Stavich case, meanwhile, the appeals chamber was called upon to assess the cross-border requirement of the crime of deportation. In its 2006 judgment, the chamber concluded that the crime of deportation requires, as a matter of customary law, a transfer across a de facto or a de jure state border. The tribunal has done more than simply identify basic general prohibitions, of course. It has repeatedly delved into and clarified the elements and precise scope of the crimes at issue. In the Kunar case, my first case upon joining the bench, the appeals chamber upheld the trial chamber's definition of rape as reflecting customary international law, noting in particular that there is no victim resistance requirement under the customary international law definition of rape. The appeals chamber also emphasized that the definition of rape under customary law did not require that the victim's lack of consent result from force or threat of force. Lack of consent could be inferred from coercive circumstances. The appeals chamber also considered the definition of the crime of torture in, the, in Kunarak, concluding as had the trial chamber that the crime of torture does not require the involvement of an individual acting in his or her capacity as a public official. This ruling is notable because it departs from the definition of torture contained in the Convention Against Torture. As the Appeals Chamber explained, the definition of torture contained in the Torture Convention is related to the purposes of that Convention, which is addressed to states and seeks to regulate their conduct. Consequently, the Torture Convention's requirement that the crime of torture be committed by an individual acting in an official capacity may be considered a limitation on the obligations of states. However, the Appeals Chamber agreed with the Trial Chamber that the public official requirement is not a requirement under customary international law in the relation to the criminal responsibility of an individual for torture when that responsibility is assessed outside the framework of the Torture Convention. The ICTY has also relied on customary law in construing modes of liability. Thus, for example, in the Tajik Appeal Judgment, the appeal cha Appeals Chamber concluded that the notion of joint criminal enterprise is firmly established in customary international law and articulated its specific forms and elements. In Celibici, which involved the question of responsibility of leaders of a concentration camp in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Appeals Chamber held that the principle of superior responsibility in customary law encompasses not only senior military officers, but also political leaders and other civilian superiors in positions of authority. The Appeals Chamber also made clear that command responsibility is not a form of strict liability. 
and in a 2003 interlocutory decision in the Haji Hasanovich case, the appeals chamber confirmed that command responsibility forms part of customary international law in relation to war crimes committed in the course of an internal armed conflict and not only international armed conflicts. Finally, the ICTY has relied on customary international law in interpreting a variety of procedural rights and requirements of fairness and of due process. In the Chrysler case, for instance, the Appeals Chamber concluded that the case law of domestic jurisdictions did not support a distinction between the right of self-representation during trial and on appeal. And in the Struva judgment, the Appeals Chamber relied on general principles of law recognized by all nations as exemplified in state practice and the jurisprudence of a range of international tribunals to elucidate the applicable standards for fitness to stand trials. The customary law jurisprudence of the ICTY has not been without its critics. In my view, however, the tribunal's chambers have examined questions of existence and applicability of customary international law carefully, cogently, and for the most part, correctly. And the impact of this jurisprudence has been felt not only in the tribunal's own cases, as is to be expected, but also in those of other international criminal courts, in the regional and international courts of all sorts, and increasingly in national courts, the civil society, intergovernmental agencies, and a variety of armed forces and military commands around the world. In considering the achievements of the ICT-1, why? One might think first of quantifiable accomplishments. The number of cases tried, the witnesses heard, the rulings rendered. These quantifiable results are, in my view, enormous. But I would urge you also to consider the tribunal's substantial contributions to customary international law and the impact of the tribunal's jurisprudence in a variety of different fora. I would now like to turn the discussion over to our distinguished guests. Since I have been focusing on the jurisprudence of the ICTY in my remarks, I will suggest that we begin with uh, Professor George Abisab, Honorary Professor of the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, past member of the WTO Appellate Panel, who, along with our dear former colleague and friend and mentor, Judge Nino Cassese, was a mastermind of the seminal 1995 interlocutory decision on jurisdiction in the Tajik case. George. <laughs>